Our reading today is from Luke chapter 13, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Imelda. Uh, well, good morning. How's everyone doing? Uh, if we haven't met, my name's Andy. Uh, I'm the pastor here at uh, Trinity Westchester. It's really good uh, to be together. I just so uh, look forward every week to this uh, weekly moment where we get to gather and be in community and hear God's word together. Uh, you can see on the screen uh, a new book that uh, Shell and I found a couple of years ago. It's a coffee table book, and uh, it's a really fun book. It's called The Infographic Bible. And it takes uh, various stories and themes of scripture, and it puts them into these very beautiful and very interesting uh, visualizations. And uh, this particular page is the top 50 subjects that Jesus taught about. And perhaps surprisingly, in those top 50, uh, number four is the topic of our scripture reading, uh, which is money. And uh, it's interesting because if you do a word study on the Gospels, the four accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you find Jesus talks about this topic of money an awful lot. In fact, in the Gospels, one out of every 10 verses is about money. Uh, there's 288 in all. And if you expand that survey to all of the Bible, you'll find this interesting comparison where there are 500 verses on prayer less than 500 verses on faith, right? Things we think are really important to following Jesus, but there are 2,000 verses, four times as many, on the topic of money and possessions. So uh, we're looking at this in the context of our series. We're in the penultimate week of this fall teaching series, What If Jesus Was Serious? And you've probably guessed by now, uh, but today we're asking the question, what if Jesus was serious about money. Now, that can be a pretty uncomfortable topic in church. Perhaps you're already wondering, how can I sneak out of that door without him noticing? But I want to encourage you today uh, to lower maybe any defenses that might have just shut up, to just put any skepticism aside and to just receive the words and the teaching of Jesus, because it is this funny topic Right, it's all around us. We use money probably every single day, but somehow when we bring it into church, it feels like we're mixing the holy with the profane. And yet Jesus seems to know something maybe that we don't know. He knows that money, wealth, possessions, these physical things, they have this huge outsized impact on us, including on our spiritual lives. They simultaneously have the ability to bring us so much joy and blessing and happiness, and yet on the flip side, also have the power to bring us sadness and challenge and strife. And so uh, for some of you, maybe today uh, is your first time at Trinity, uh, or maybe you're kind of new to faith, you're still exploring, and you're wondering, what is this all about? Is this kind of an insider topic just for the faithful and committed? And maybe that's kind of true, but I really believe today, wherever you're at in your journey with God, wherever you're at in your uh, journey and getting part, to be part of our Trinity community, there's something for you here today, because The heart of today is about where we place our trust and where we get our security from. Where we place our trust and where we get our security from. And in fact, I'm convinced today 
That God isn't looking to extract something from you, but rather he wants something for you. Do you believe that? Turn to your neighbor and say, God wants something for you. I know that's corny, but I want you to do it because that's the heart of today. He wants something for you. He wants a deeper trust and a deeper security. So we're going to look at this parable. It's um, unflatteringly called the parable of the rich fool. Uh, It's not one of the more heartwarming parables Jesus tells, but he does tell it, and so we want to pay uh, attention. And it begins with this question. I mean, that's putting it politely. It's really more of a command that someone gives to Jesus. Verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You can tell right in the first verse, there's some family drama going on. There's this dispute between siblings about who gets what uh, once the uh, family uh, parents have passed. We don't know the full backstory, but we can guess, based on the culture of that day, that this is probably a younger brother complaining about a firstborn brother. Because in that day, the younger brother would have got really a tiny slice of the inheritance, whereas the firstborn brother would have received almost all of it. And so this younger brother probably wants Jesus to kind of come into his corner, be on his side, advocate for him, and sort of put his thumb on the scale so that he gets a bigger portion. But Jesus, as uh, he typically does, refuses to just stay at the surface level issue or question. Instead, he goes to this deeper place. He uses sort of spiritual x-ray vision to see what's really happening in the depths of this guy's heart. And he he says to him, take care, be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. That's Jesus' response. Now, if you or I uh, were that brother, we might say, hang on a minute, Jesus. Wait a second, who said anything about covetousness? I'm just trying to get a fair deal. What's wrong with that? But you can't fool Jesus. Many have tried, including this guy, and none have been successful. He knows what's really going on. He says, take care, be on your guard, be vigilant against covetousness, which, you know, today we would probably call greed. He says, be on your guard against greed. Why? Because your life is not about possessions. Life, actually, in that sentence is really more of a metaphor for salvation, your sense of meaning and purpose and well-being and security before God. Jesus is saying, don't get that from your bank account. And then he gets into this parable, into the story, right? The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and this rich man in the story thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. The successful farmer makes a killing, right? In today's terms, you might say his hedge fund had a banner year. He got a sweet year-end bonus. He made partner at the firm. He's rolling in cash. He has one of those first-class problems, right? Where do I put all my money? Don't you wish you had that problem? And so he has this idea. He says, I'll do this. I'll tear down my bonds. I'll build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. In other words, I'm going to set up these financial vehicles to be really savvy and safeguard all of this stuff that I've amassed. Now, to pause here for a second, at this point, we might argue, you know, this guy really hasn't done anything wrong. He's actually done something perfectly fine. He, he just had a good year, right? It doesn't say it was ill-gotten money. There weren't any financial crimes that made his crops grow really well. He just had a good year. His stock went up. And actually, even in Scripture, there are multiple, multiple occasions where that kind of happening is not only uh, sort of permitted, but even affirmed, right? You might know the parable in Matthew 25, where there are three servants, each uh, given some money, and it's the ones who make a really good return on that investment who are praised by Jesus in that par- parable. There's nothing wrong with income and growing investments and things like that, but what we see in the parable of the rich fool is that there's something else going on. It's not a financial test, rather it's a heart test. 
That these giant bonds have more going on than just sort of wise stewardship of resources. Get this in verse 19. The farmer says, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Five different times uh, in the parable, the father speaks of what I will do, right? I will do this. I will tear down. I will build. I will store my grain, my goods, my bond, my soul. It's all about him. He's been incredibly successful in doing what? In producing security for himself outside of Jesus. He checks his bank account and he says, I'm very satisfied with what I see. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. That's where that phrase comes from, is this parable. And it's all in this self-congratulatory, self-pat on the back, this self-talk. Wow, look at you, Andy. Look at what you've done. Look at what you've built. Look at this wonderful road ahead in your life. But then God starts to speak. And he says to him, fool. Fool. Who wants to be called a fool by God? (laughs) Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? God says, you think the good times are about to roll, but little do you know, tomorrow morning, you won't even have a way to enjoy this bounty. What good is it all anyway? And again, to be clear, the man's never reprimanded for having a lot. He's never critiqued for doing well. His his downfall is not his wealth. His downfall is that he allowed his wealth to infect his heart. That his money became his source of meaning and salvation. He takes the really good thing that God has blessed him with, and he takes it and makes it his source of security and pushes God to the side. So Jesus ends the parable by saying, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Meaning, the peril that farmer was in was not only dangerous for him. It's dangerous for all of you listening, Jesus says, and it's dangerous for us today, too. The biblical scholar uh, Craig Craig Blomberg uh, summarizes what Jesus is getting at this way. He says, materialism may well be the biggest competitor with the God of Jesus Christ for the allegiance of human hearts in our world today. There's a competition going on. When we look at the witness of Scripture, material possessions, money, wealth, it has this ability to be an incredible blessing from God to be enjoyed, and at the same time also has this power to turn our hearts away from God. Again, to be clear, Jesus, nor anyone else, nor I am saying don't have wise financial stewardship. No one's saying don't save for retirement or provide for your family. What Jesus is saying, though, is that it's so very easy to have an unhealthy relationship with wealth. It's easy to fall prey to the foolishness of greed. It's easy to elevate our financial status to be our ultimate thing. And when it becomes that ultimate thing, Jesus is pushed to the side. And when Jesus is pushed to the side, we really suffer. You know, for me, there have been times and seasons in my life when, if I'm honest, my day-to-day life experience has felt quite like an emotional roller coaster on this topic, where the highs of the roller coaster are the moments when I feel really financially secure and the lows of the roller coaster are the moment where I feel financially vulnerable, where how I feel on a given day or how I feel about my life overall just becomes totally tied to my bank account. Will this place that I'm putting my security remain steadfast? If we're asking that question, if that sense of well-being for us is tied to our wealth or our net worth, the truth, as so many of us have experienced, is that we will always be anxious about what lies around the corner. Will the thing that's making me secure right now still be there tomorrow, still be there the next day. The good news, though, of today's scripture is that we don't have to be gripped by that anxiety. 
uh, Craig Blomberg uh, goes on. He says, the best way, therefore, to maximize the goodness of material possessions and to minimize their negative effects is to give a generous, even sacrificial amount of them away. It always involves giving up something that a person values considerably. That's what Jesus says at the end of the parable too. He says there is actually a way to divorce ourselves from the gravitational pull of all this stuff. That if greed is the thing that is poisoning our hearts, there is an antidote. And Jesus says it's this thing in verse 21, being rich toward God. Being rich toward God. And so in the rest of our time, what we're going to look at are five principles of being rich towards God. Five principles uh, of Christian generosity, and you can see them there. That being rich towards God, Christian generosity, is five things. It's always a response to Jesus. It's more than money. It's part of the normal Christian life. It's a practice that reorders our loves, and it's given to God through his people. So we'll, we'll go through these uh, just briefly. So first of all, Christian generosity, being rich towards God, it's always, always a response to Jesus. At the core of the parable is this question of motivation. What is going on at a heart level for the farmer? Now, there are so many and varied reasons for generosity and giving in our world today. Uh, it was interesting, we were on vacation a couple of months ago, and we took Phoebe to uh, our two-year-old to this very beautiful children's museum. And uh, I noticed something there that I hadn't noticed, right? So often in museums, you'll see like a plaque here and there of like who donated what thing. But this place was like at another complete level. It's like you couldn't walk two feet without seeing a plaque with someone's name on it. You're, like you, the, the like covering the awning there, you know, it was the Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so awning. You get into the vestibule, I mean, you can see it right there. It's like four feet deep. There was so-and-so's vestibule. And like every little thing, I went into the bathroom almost expecting the urinal to have like a plaque in front of it, like the <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so urinal. I'm like, seriously, is this where we've gotten? And it's not that it's a bad thing for, you know, people to donate to museums, get their name on it, you know, that's normal. But this, it was just like in the extreme. But it highlights this reason that sometimes generosity happens, right? Getting public credit or prestige, and there are many others. Maybe for some of us, we've uh, had our generosity motivated by guilt or obligation, right? How many times you go to check out at the grocery store and you ask if you want to donate $1 to XYZ cause, right? And if they ask you verbally, how do you say no to that? Maybe it's kind of a feel-good factor, right? I feel like a virtuous person when I'm generous. Or maybe it's different. Maybe there's kind of like a provider-client thing that goes on, right? I donate to this organization, and they provide me services in return. Maybe it's about the tax break, right? We're all trying to lower our taxes all of the time, aren't we? And donating helps that. Or maybe it's just habit, right? We're just in the habit of donating in a particular way. And none of those motivations are bad. Actually, they're good. A gift is given in every case. But for followers of Jesus, there is kind of a rub, there's a rub when our motivation for being generous is ultimately still about us, right? There is such a thing as consumeristic generosity. I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but it happens where sometimes our primary motivation for giving and generosity is more about what we get out of it than the thing that we're giving toward, and so, by contrast, distinctively Christian generosity, being rich towards God, it has a totally different motivation. And that totally different motivation is it's a worship response to Jesus. It's all about responding to who he is and what he's done, that he's given all of himself for us. Philippians chapter 2 reminds us that, that Jesus, he was in the form of God. He didn't count equality with God anything to be grasped. But he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus, the, the most glorious, the most beautiful, the, the most humble one, he humbled himself. He gave all of himself for us, even to the point of death. And our generosity is a response to that. He's so worthy. He's done so much for us. He's done everything for us. We can never repay him. 
Let's not think that when we're giving, we're repaying Jesus. But what we can do is worship and thank him. And that's what happens in our giving. Secondly, uh, Christian generosity is more than money. Because there is so much more about living generously than just our money and possessions. The biblical idea is an idea of stewardship. right? God has entrusted us with things that are his, they're not ours. And ultimately, our role is to be faithful with those resources. And at Trinity, we think about holistic generosity, about stewardship of being of our time, our talent, and our treasure. It's all three of those things. We're called to be generous in all of them. And we need to not forget those first couple. We live, especially in this uh, after-COVID world, in a a time-poor community. We're all running from one thing to the next to the next. We don't have enough time for anything. And so in the midst of that, being generous with our time, giving our time to people and organizations and family members and whoever who needs it, is actually a countercultural reflection of the heart of God. I'm giving you something that I have the least of. It's this moment where we become practically the hands and feet of Jesus around us. We've talked about it a lot, but I've just been so uh, encouraged by all of the time generosity that's been poured out in the last couple of months through so many who've uh, served after the flooding uh, in Mamaroneck. There's a few uh, of our Trinity people. Believe it or not, these kids tore down that entire wall. They're very strong. Uh, But I love how even on Labor Day, uh, so many people put aside their family, their holiday plans and said, you know what, we're going to serve our community with our time and with our literal, I don't know if demolition is a talent, but talent and, and muscle, right? It's so needed. It was really needed in this moment. It's really needed again and again and again. And there's opportunities, Kathleen highlighted some of them uh, already, where we can lean into that as a community. It's so much more than our money. And at the same time, it's also not less than our money. Our generosity is more than money, it's our time, it's our talent, but it's not less. In 2 Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul encourages that community. He says, as you excel in everything, and he gives this list, right, of the things that they're doing so well, their faith, their speech, their knowledge, their earnestness, he says, as you excel in that, also excel in generosity. It's this both and, it's our time, it's our talent, and it's our treasure. We want to be rich towards God in all of those ways. Thirdly, Christian generosity, meaning rich towards God, is part of the normal Christian life. And the pastor Rick Warren has famously said, if you don't trust God with your money, you don't trust God. Ouch. What he means is, this isn't a special interest topic. It's not like I'm an apprentice to Jesus and then maybe I'll like bolt on this generosity thing. He's saying our generosity, our approach to being rich toward God is actually a reflection of our overall maturity in Christ. Because when we're we're living generous lives, we're actually living the way Jesus lived. He gave all of himself for us, and so we reflect him when we're generous. And actually, that's the reason that I'm excited about this topic. This doesn't feel like an awkward topic to me because I also don't feel awkward about talking about the Bible. I don't feel awkward about talking about prayer or forgiveness or community. And this is another one of those things. In the same way that we'd say all of those things are spiritually important, so are our finances, so is money, so is our generosity. It's a normal part of the Christian life. The church has done a great job of saying those two things are separate, but we want to bring it back together. Fourthly, it's a practice that reorders our loves. And of course, the implication is something is out of order, and it is. Christian generosity is something that helps put Jesus back at the top of our list of loves. But because the idol of wealth and consumerism fights so hard, it's also something that's difficult. Talking about a a particular dimension of generosity, uh, the pastor Francis Chan says, downsizing so that others might upgrade is, listen to this list, biblical, great, beautiful, great, and nearly unheard of. Why is it unheard of to downsize so that others might upgrade? Well, it's because 
Radical generosity is so hard to come to terms with in our Western world. Being rich towards God requires something that in our culture we almost never do, which is cut into our lifestyle. Right? There's this normal pattern where we set our lifestyle at a particular level, and usually it goes up over the course of time, and then what's ever left over kind of here, we'll kind of give a little bit of that. Right? That's the norm in Western culture. And yet the Christian way is so different than that. It's giving out of our first fruits. It's giving uh, primarily. And in almost every case, it involves giving up something that we like or had other plans for in order to invest in the thing that we love the most, Jesus and his kingdom. I love Kathy Keller's response when asked, how much should someone give to the local church? And she simply said, you should feel it. Obviously, that's a generalization, but it really drives the point home. Again, it gets at the idea that because of how strong this tidal pull is in our culture, it can be difficult to actually live into this. And there have been seasons, again, for me, when it's been a struggle. Times when unexpected expenses have hit in a particular year, and it feels like the margin for giving is really small. There was a particular period when... Uh, 10 years ago when I was waiting for my visa uh, to move to this country and I made you know, literally zero dollars in that time and so I had very little to give. Uh, what I did have was a lot of time but uh, if I'm honest, I didn't give very much of myself then either. All of these things have this pull on us and they pull us to, towards prioritizing all of these things other than being rich towards God. There's other uh, reasons that it can feel hard, too. Maybe the principle of the tithe, the uh, Christian encouragement to give the very first 10% of our income to God, maybe that just feels like a giant leap. Maybe you're in yourself a time of uh, financial difficulty right now, and you just feel like you simply can't afford to give. Maybe you and your spouse are just not on the same page about faith or about generosity, and those things are hard to reconcile. There are these very real things that can stand in the way of our generosity, but when we do it, it reorders our loves. It defuses the power of the idol of money and wealth. And so even though it's challenging, it's so worth it because of that. Finally, Uh, Christian generosity, being rich towards God, we're giving to God, but it happens through his people. I was thinking again uh, this week about the offering in the Old Testament, right? If you read much of the Old Testament, the people would come together uh, in the temple, and they would sing and stuff, but the highlight of what would happen is when everyone would bring their crops and their animals up, and they'd put them on the altar, First, they'd kill the animals. It was kind of a gruesome event. And then they put them on the altar and set it on fire. And I was thinking, man, we are so distanced from that, right? Thankfully, no, like, farm animals in here. But we're so distanced from it because even our giving, right? Like, so many of us, you know, we give online. We do it on our phone. We do it in an app. But, like, can you imagine if, like, I was about to announce what we're going to do next week, and I was like, hey, bring some giant piles of cash We'll put them on this table, and then I'll light them on fire, and that'll be our worship for the day, (laughs) right? Like, what if that's what we actually did? And of course, we'd be like, that is so wasteful. Why would we do that? But that's what worship was in the Old Testament, and it made me really grateful. It made me really grateful because we get a better deal. We get so much more of a better deal because when we give, we actually get to do something with those resources, Acts chapter 2 is this amazing picture of the first followers of Jesus and how they were rich towards God in every uh, way. I won't read this whole thing, but they were, they were devoted to teaching. They gathered together. They sold their possessions and belongings, and they distributed them to everyone who had need. They were generous with their homes because that's where they would meet, and they uh, had glad and generous hearts. What's inspiring to me about Acts chapter 2 is the idea of what if we had an Acts chapter 2 community in Westchester County today? Don't you want that? What if we were this hub of generosity for the good of this community, for the good of the county, and the good of the world? What could God do if he really got a hold of our hearts 
with this idea. I'm, I'm praying for that among us. Because whatever our level of means, whatever size gift you're able to give, every one of them matters. They matter so deeply to God, and they matter to the communities and the people who will be impacted as a result. That's why for uh, Shell and I, we give the majority of our Christian giving right here to Trinity because it's the place that God has called us to invest our time and our talent and our treasure. We know we're giving to God. We're responding to Jesus, but we also have the privilege of seeing that benefit so many people right here in Westchester County. And I'd encourage uh, you to think about it that same way that the largest portion of your generosity could go to your church home, whether that's here or whether that's somewhere else. Not because you're meeting a budget, not because you're kind of weirdly tipping God for what he's done for you, not because you're paying for spiritual services, because it's our worship. It's our worship to Jesus, and it forms our hearts. So being rich towards God, what does it look like? It looks like these five things, responding to Jesus, Recognizing it's more than but not less than our money, that it's part of a normal Christian life. It's a practice that reorders our loves, and we give it to God, but it happens through his people. Here's the thing as you, you look at that list. Guilt, feeling bad, a sense of obligation doesn't do anything. It just makes you feel bad. What changes our hearts When it comes to this topic, what gives us a deeper trust in God, what moves our security from our bank account to the cross and the tomb and the resurrection of Jesus is allowing it to be that worship response. Seeing Jesus and his beauty and his glory and all that he has done so clearly that we just want to pull all of ourselves out to him. 2 Corinthians again says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Isn't that amazing? We're going to respond. And uh, as we do so, uh, Riley, go ahead and put up that prayer. Uh, So this is a, a prayer Uh, that God would give us generous hearts as a prayer we use from time to time at Trinity. And uh, here's what we're going to do. Tori's going to play for like a couple of minutes. I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit. I just want you to reflect on these words here. And particularly just to ask, Holy Spirit, is there a particular line of this prayer uh, that you want to emphasize to and for me today? Is there a place where you want to form me more deeply? And so just ask him that. Uh, And then after a couple of minutes, I'm going to have a stand and we're going to pray it uh, together uh, as a community. So, uh, God, we thank you for all that you're doing right here in this room right now. And we ask, Spirit of God, would you come? Would you come? Would you make our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears alive to how you want to speak to us? And pray, I pray, would you highlight uh, what is just uniquely tailored for us in this prayer right now? So take a couple of minutes to reflect.
Lord, I think, is probably highlighting different things for all of us just to share. For, for me, it's that second line, there's nothing I have that you have not given me. So easy for me to think that it's really mine. Uh, but let's stand right now and let's pray this uh, prayer together and ask the Lord to do something in our hearts that only he can do. So let's pray. Father, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing I have that you have not given me. The way of your kingdom is the way of generosity. Help me to honor you with my resources. Free me from the deceit of riches. Lead me on the path of generosity. For your glory, Lord, for the abundance of my own life and for the sake of others. Amen. Lord, would you embed that prayer in our hearts? Would you do all that you want to do? And Lord, we look forward to the, the day when your kingdom is, is growing at a rapid pace because of all that you've done in us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.